What is up, Adam Elmakaias, my talk. friend? What is up, Neil? It has, Westfall. it has been a while, huh? Hey, but I'm actually very, I'm excited about every episode of Don't Shit on the Bus, but this one I am specifically excited for, and I'll let you introduce the guests, but I just want to say it's cool to have an artist and their tech on here, because what a dream conversation this is for me to be able to listen to and learn from. Yeah, it's, it's uh, for me, it was kind of, I was too scared to even ask if he wanted to be on our podcast because I look up to him that much. And Adam had to actually reach out to uh, the guest today. Uh, his name is Mark Hoppus and his tech, Robert Ortiz. They make up the duo that is stage right for Blink-182. Mark Hoppus, Robert Ortiz. They've worked together for 10 years, 11 years, t- fucking I think it's, I think 15 it's years. On, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Like, they are the ultimate uh, duo for this conversation in this podcast. They really kind of give insight into the trust that really is needed to kind of have that confidence to go out on stage and be able to do what you do. Uh, and Robert does that for Mark. And he only, they let us into this relationship, into their world. They tell us what it takes to be on the road with Blink-182, whether you're a support band or you're a fan or you're someone that works on their crew. They take care of everyone and they really elevate the game as far as that's concerned. And they let us in on that, on what that looks like. Yeah, whether you realize it or not, it takes a certain type of person, communication, relationship, and, you know, love for this career to maintain a job for 15 years with the same person. That's a lot of FaceTime. That's a lot of coexisting. That's a lot of working together as a team. And the intricacies of that are not only interesting to me and Neil, but we think the points that are established through this conversation are so important to learn no matter where you're at in your touring career because they're what we believe in and root our values from so deeply. Uh, Neil specifically looked up to and still looks up to Mark Hoppus for the majority of his life. And I look up to Robert Ortiz. He's also a photographer and he's done this for a while. And it was kind of just a, a dream come true for us to be able to have them on the podcast. So we really appreciated you guys joining us. Let's get into this. Oh, wait. My favorite part of the week, the Patreon. I How could we? We almost forgot. You can't forget but our patrons, Neil. Come on. This week, we have some amazing additions. Um, one of the perks of being on the Patreon is you get your name right on the podcast, which is pretty fucking cool. Uh, <laughs> and the lucky people that get their name right on this one, because it's probably the coolest one we've done so far. Here they are. Adam, take it away. We've got Dove, Burke, Carrie, Carl, Brooke, And Parker, welcome to the Patreon. And I just want to throw a little extra note in there this week. We do have a new website, don'tshitonthebus.com. Makes sense. And it's got everything on there. We've got article versions of most of the concepts we talk about, additional content, a video version of all the podcasts. Check it out. We're having merch soon. And uh, yeah, if we can do anything else to help improve this experience for you, just hit us up. We're here to teach you everything and anything about the touring world. So we'll look forward to seeing you in the Patreon or on the Discord. Come hang. Neil, let's get to this podcast. Let's this go. is a good one. Let's get on this bus. All right. Thank you guys yeah. for joining us today. No this problem. Awesome. We appreciate your time and your faces and your voices all at once. Um, all Neil, right. you wanna uh you wanna get us started here, Neil? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, guys. Hi, how are you? How's it going? This Hi. Is, uh, this is our podcast. It's called Don't Shit on the Bus, and we're trying to get people on tour. Uh, why is it called that? Because I don't know what kind of buses you guys roll with, but I only roll on a bus that you can poop in. See, so hopefully we get everyone to that level, but um, yeah, our buses, you can't poop in there. We thought it was a myth. Like, we thought that people say you can poop on buses, but you can actually, you're not lying to us, you can actually poop on your bus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just on get one with a bus. macerator. You have to get one with a macerator. Oh my gosh. Neil, write that down. This is not, I we really we had a, we asked other people were like, do you guys think it's real or or is this like a a, a thing that everyone talks about is real and it's real. It's been confirmed. Yeah. It is real. It is real. Uh I think it was back in the day where they just had the uh the kind of toilets where you push on the lever and it just opens up a hole and it just drops in the hole. <laughs> Like that, you don't want that. You want the kind that has water in the toilet, like a regular house toilet. Oh, is this yeah, what you guys we, talk about? I assume this is this all is the you guys talk about. Yeah. It's literally two yeah, and a okay. half hours. It's a bus plumbing. <laughs> Welcome to <laughs> bus plumbing. <laughs> that would be. <laughs> Our favorites are Kohler, but, um, you know, we really, uh, we like to explore other options. So. Okay. 
Well, no, I'll talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. I mean, the goal of the podcast is to treat, to teach people how to tour, what touring's about, and kind of, I don't know, teach them our values. And something we really liked about that we both experienced from touring with you guys and learning from you guys is how you guys tour. And we kind of wanted to learn, I don't know, how you guys got started, your relationship, how you met, and then how it transferred into today and how you became such a good group of people from band to crew to tour with. Because, I mean, Neil can say this much more than I can. I've only been on a few tours, but Neil did like a month and a half or two months with you guys. And Yeah, yeah it was it was like one of the best experiences that we've had uh, being an opener. Uh, it really felt like a family on every level, even from the first day of tour. So, oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, I've, I'll tell you where. I mean, we got started. My my touring began literally uh, driving my mom's, uh, my stepdad's station wagon filled with equipment uh, to shows in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Arizona, places like that. Uh, where we would just load up the station wagon and drive, and the air conditioning broke, and sometimes we'd have to take two cars. Eventually. Eventually, we were able to buy a van. That was a big deal for us. We had our own van. That's when it's real. That's when it's real. Yeah. It's like we're, we're doing this. We're invested. And Robert, yeah, we're gonna, I, yeah. this is a band thing. We're going to do this. Sorry, yeah. Robert, go ahead. No, I was uh, just going to say, where did, where did you start at, Robert? We, we'll eventually get to where your paths collided, but what did you start doing? Um, kind of the same thing. Um, just throwing gear in whoever's car and running all over LA, you know what I mean? And then eventually would branch out to Santa Barbara, going to the Anaconda, then going further, you go a little further North and a little further South. And you start hitting, you know, Orange County, San Diego. And then, then it was like, okay, we could leave on a Thursday and come back on Monday. And it was a lot of that for a long time. And then that's mainly when I was like playing in bands. And then, yeah. um, uh, then I started working with bands and I, you know, it was like get in the bus. I remember like my first like van tour. It was like get, we went and picked up the vans from the rental company. We got two vans and we drove from Anaheim to Albuquerque in one shot. And I was like, oh, wow. oh this is real. That's like, like a 12 hour drive. Yeah. Maybe longer. Maybe longer. Because we had to stop, I guess, a bunch of times. But I don't remember exactly. But yeah, that was. You can't shit in a van. No. No. I mean, you can. But you don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> Other people would get bummed. I think that's really where the name kind of came from is like kind of being courteous to others. And, you know, being on tour, you do live on top of each other. And the smaller the touring, the more on top of each other you are. And most of the time when you're touring in small, small setups like that, you're like right in the beginning. So everyone's excited and you're cool with like talking Anything. shit to each other and playing pranks and everyone's like fine oh, yeah. with like, Oh, his pee got on my leg or whatever, you know, like that kind of shit. And it's like, as you been into it for a while, you're like, you know what? I'd really rather you not poop anywhere near me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Mark, after you guys started touring, you went in your van, you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Eventually, hopefully you get a bus, but when did you guys start adding in crew or was it just your friends at the beginning? Like when did that start being integrated? It was always our friends who were, were like, oh, yeah, you know, I can come on tour with you and tune your guitar and hand it to you. And I'll do, you know, we had a friend come out that did basically everything, uh, tour managing, merch. Uh, somebody else came out and did guitars, I think. It was all just friends. And then we started getting, I think I would say, professional uh, crew around probably late Dude Ranch, early Enema of the State. It's so like 96, 97. Is that? I mean, yeah, something like okay. that. And, and it was, they were people who were talented and, you know, new instruments and new touring and new uh, business and things like that. But they weren't road dogs by any means. They were just friends of ours that were like, yeah, I can take a month off of work and, you know, sit was, in a van with you. <laughs> was that easier to do, like being in Southern California, like having like that wealth of people that were kind of into the music scene? Was that a easier feat to take on? I don't know. I don't know if it was easier or more difficult than anywhere else. I mean, was it hard like, in Florida? Yes. Uh, <laughs> no. Honestly. <laughs> the people okay. in our band were like the only people around that were like like us, so we were like... I don't know. Well, all of our friends were like, uh, you know, college age, kind of first jobs. No, Nobody had a career. Nobody was married. Yeah. Nobody had really like a serious girlfriend or anything, so for them to come out on the road wasn't a, wasn't an issue at all. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And then Robert, yeah. you yeah. you correct me if I'm wrong, but you kind of you knew Daniel who was with them. I'm assuming around this time. And Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but uh, and that's at that how, time, no. Um, uh, Daniel wasn't okay. I I I'd known Daniel. I've been friends since we were like really young. Um, that's not how I met Mark. I met Mark through uh, their one of their guitar techs was a buddy of mine who toured with. Oh. another band and we toured together and then um who was that who was that who was that Derek puppety oh yeah yeah okay got it cool yeah. we're going we're going back yeah yeah that's way way back so i was so he and i had toured together on another tour and then but i'd known who they were and i think i've even i've even seen them at some point but um uh he asked me to come out and do uh do some gigs back when Scott was still playing drums. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's when, it, and like, it was like Greg Dean or Stuart was there. Did yeah. a couple shows. I did a couple shows with you guys back then. Little things here and there, like fly out dates and stuff. And that's kind of how we started like hanging out and talking and stuff. Yeah. Pretty much. So, but yeah, yes. that was around that live around that time a little bit, maybe later from the beginning. Was it always just like you and Mark or did you kind of work with everybody? Uh, when I started working with, with Blake, with Mark. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it was plus 44 is when I first oh, okay. came on to work and it was just Mark. Oh, okay. then we know I did guitars for Craig too, a little bit on plus 44. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, but that was like towards the end of it. And then, uh, but yeah, just Mark and then just stayed with Mark all the way through. So you guys knew each other for a long period of time before you actually worked together like professionally. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I understand that you guys kind of relate on a lot of different levels. You have age, uh, your favorite band is The Cure. I think that you guys share that. And we know it's kind of an important part of being friends with anybody. But after you guys met, like, I'm trying to basically say, like, after you guys started touring with each other, how did you become friends and decide, hey, this is going to work out. Hey, we're going to keep touring with each other. This is my guy. This is my tech. I want to work with him. And from both ends, like, I don't know if, Robert, you had a, a moment where you're like, hey, I want to keep working for Mark. I want to, I want to work with him for, you know, a significant amount of time or did it just kind of happen gradually organically? It, well, for me, it happened kind of organically and naturally because my best friend is a drum tech and it was like, I was working on other stuff and I was doing, I was more doing like tour managing and production at that time. And I was really over it. I mean, I did, I did well at it and, um, I just wasn't really happy chasing luggage and all that kind of stuff and just doing settlement and that kind of thing and booking flights. It, it was fine, but I just wasn't, I didn't dig it. And, um, uh, it just, I came to do that and we was just started out, you know, it was like whatever. And then it just built and built and built. And then it was that we had this like unified thing with the band and the crew and we were all friends and we'd known each other for a long time. And we, a lot of miles with each other. And then it just kind of just built to me, you know, that, um, and it just, it just worked out that way. It was not, there was no, like, for me, there was no like aha moment. Yeah. You know? I know with our tech, it was just like, he just was like the moment that we were like, yes, you work and you do this. And it, like, I feel comfortable. I was just like, well, you're not going anywhere. I mean, like we're going to be <laughs> leaving on tour soon and you got to come with us. You know, it wasn't like a, I didn't give him an option. I don't know if that's how it was with you guys. You know, it's like, it's I think it really, that. initially it worked out because of scheduling. Like every time that Blink was touring, Robert was available. And then once you become comfortable with the tech, then you really hope that they are available when you're touring. And then yeah. at some point you're like, I'm going to pay you to make sure that you're available for when we go out on tour. Because I don't know, Blink has spent decades putting together an amazing road crew and i think just from us touring starting off small and building that way i think that uh we hire people who aren't dicks like we yeah. are not the kind of band that's like we're not moving our drum kit you guys set up in front of us because we're about you know i mean there have been tours where we've had to have people set up in front of us but it wasn't because our crew were dicks or they were too lazy to move the uh, the drum riser it's because you know travis has a a drum gag that <laughs> it literally yeah. has to get moved by a forklift and you know 18 people to uh take it all apart and put it back together um i, I just think we have rad people and and assholes don't last long in the blink organization except for the band members ourselves <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Yeah, it's interesting you say that because we weren't sure. We always assumed, but we weren't sure if it was a conscious effort on the band's part to be like, hey, everybody who works for us is going to be, you know, not an asshole. Or if it just kind of happened that way because you attract those types of people. So it's good to hear that it was like, hey, we don't do this shit. And if you do do this, you're out. Yeah, we, you know, we we kind of from the from the band down or just like, you know, don't treat opening bands like trash. Don't uh, don't assert authority just for the sake of asserting authority. You know, I think it starts from the band kind of instructing the tour manager, tour manager on down, you know, to production manager. And it's fun. Like, you know, the, the proper attitude is we're here to put on a kick ass show. We want everybody to have a great time. Go home safe. We want to get our crew taken care of and, you know, back in their bunks and on to the next gig. Yeah. I think another thing, too, is like we all kind of like in the Blink camp anyways, we all kind of came from the same place. We all came from like that Southern California punk rock. You know, everybody's out in a dirt field doing a yeah. show with like a mm-hmm. million screaming kids. And like, you know, there's a some Gatorades or some waters if you're lucky. You know, we all kind of yeah. came from that. <laughs> and um, it was kind of we were all in that same kind of headspace. You know what I mean? And it was that is another thing. It's like that, um, you know, when you just you it's like when you're, you know, bonded by trauma, it's that it was it's kind of that, you know, and we all kind of came up that way. You know, there's we've had people that, you know, that didn't have that that kind of past and that came from, let's just say, straight to arena bands. And it just showed, you know, what yeah, I mean? compared a- to some other to compared to like the core people like we all the band and like the core crew and most of us all came from that. It's like and when you can kind of appreciate shows. just four Gatorades. Yeah. That's the only thing yeah. that you get. It's like, you kind of, you really can get through anything. It's like, it's like, it's just like Robert said, it's like the bands that have the quickest success end up being the biggest jerks because they feel, I don't know, somehow it's like, Oh, we deserve this. Cause we're so good. Obviously we must be great because we got famous so quick. Right. Um, you know, the people that have to work their way up know what it's like. And so, I don't know, I think you just approach it with a much cooler attitude and, and, you know, accommodating and we're here to put on a good show. You know, we want the opening bands to look great. We want us to look incredible. And, uh, (laughs) you know, we don't, we want the show to build, but we don't want to hamper other people's show and be like, oh, well, you can't, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. Because by the time we walk out on stage, we want to be like the Kings. Right. Although well, we will, we will limit some, we will limit some production, but you know, nothing. Well, it's like everyone can't come think. out and have a rocket ship for a drum riser, you know, it's like, yeah, you can't do that like four times in a row and expect for it to be like special, like every single time, you know, that show but had we were, four rocket ship drum risers. <laughs> <laughs> but when we toured with the day to remember, I, we, we were like, wow, these guys have a lot of cool gags. Like we got to do some more, some more cool stuff out here. More than, more than just, uh, you know, confetti and whatnot well, we stole streamers straight from you guys <laughs> <laughs> i mean we just know our music's like not gonna get us there alone you know it's like <laughs> we gotta like have like some beach balls or something for people to be like oh sick you know there's some cool stuff happening over here or you know like when they get back from getting a beer they're like still into the show you know it's like yeah it's by the way hard. congratulations on the new album congratulations on the baby congratulations oh, yeah. on the uh Shop opening up? Did did you just not have Thank enough you. shit going on in 2020? You had to like do a uh, bunch of other stuff. Literally had nothing going on. No. Okay. Uh, no, it was it was one of those things where it's like we don't know if we're gonna be able to tour anymore. And uh, I'm like, I, it's one of those things where you're just like, I don't know what to do with my hands. I'm like, I don't have anything <laughs> going on Thursday. We might as well try and get that restaurant open. Or Mary's like, oh shit, I'm pregnant. I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 You know, just stuff like that. And yeah, I don't know. It's like we've been we've been working for however long. I think it's been like close to like, I don't know, eight or nine years straight. And just the idea of not doing something was just so scary to me that I would rather fill my time with everything else. That's, I guess, to a lot of other people seems pretty daunting or scary. But it just to me, it just seemed easier. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. When when you guys were talking about. uh kind of how you don't want to treat openers poorly. Did you guys ever experience that maybe when you were touring together and you weren't the headliners? Did you guys know what it felt like to be on the receiving end of it? Oh, for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't remember specific instances of it, but I always remember like, 
you know, setting up your drum kit in front of somebody else, not having room on stage to to move around, not really feeling welcome in catering, not really feeling like um, valued as part of the tour. And people, you know, I mean, for the most part, bands bring other bands on tour because they bring something to the table, like some amount of tickets, some interest uh, on a on a billing so that when people see... You know, we bring a day to remember and all time low out on tour because they're worth tickets and we think they're going to help the show and we think that it stacks the bill and we think that people are going to be like, oh, that's a show I'm not going to miss because I love Blink and I love a day to remember and I will tolerate all time low, I guess. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, you know, so why would you invite people to go out on tour with you because there were some tickets and then at the same time turn around and be like, well, you can't don't look at Mark when he walks down the hall. I mean, I, I understand if people don't want to look at me, but it's not ordered by, by anybody. <laughs> yeah, man. Such a, it's such an interesting dynamic, too, because it's like, I feel like with us, we try to bring bands out that we're, like, interested in, you know? Like, you're like, I kind of want to get to know these guys. Like, what they're doing is really cool. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and kind of having that relationship, like, in my mind, that's, like, what I'm trying to build. It's like, I see these people that are kind of going through the same thing, like, we went through or we're going through currently, and it's like, hey, man. It's hard to find friends out here in the music business. It's like, you guys are kind of similar to us. Maybe we'll kind of get along. This would be great. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, It's a small community, you know? And we're travels fast. And when you know, like, if you're one of those crews and bands that are awesome to hang out with, you're going to, it's just going to be a good time, you know? People get drawn in. I mean, we got along great with your crew. I feel like, yeah, I was going to say, like, oh, yeah, they went, you guys, we, we broke a day to remember his crew. We, I was going to say, got... Johnny's almost died four to seven times <laughs> because of the Ocho. Uh, I was like, I was, I was scared to go on your guys' crew bus because of the time that you showed our guitar tech. I, I only go on the Ocho maybe once or twice a tour. <laughs> Ever. Like, it's, it's like, it's a you, dangerous place. You really, got to know what you're getting into when you walk on the Ocho. For those of you that don't know what the Ocho is, the Ocho is the backline uh, bus for our crew. And it started off because they were bus number eight on the reunion tour. And it was Daniel, Robert, um, I think Doug was on it at that yeah. point. Was Doug on the original yeah. Ocho? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, our monitor guy, Steve Gregg. And it was just a, like all the backline guys. And it's all the dudes that just go harder than anybody Last to bed, mm-hmm. first ones up. Nah, not first ones up in no. the morning, but definitely no. last ones. Definitely last ones to bed. Um, first ones done on stage. Yeah, first ones off stage. Last ones to bed. Um, and so yeah, I just had this re- this reputation of the Ocho being the bus that people went and got way too drunk on, and it it's stuck. Like, even though yeah. like you know a bunch of like what half the people on the Ocho are sober now. Pretty much, yeah. So you can't yeah. make eye contact with Daniel. <laughs> and not expect to get pulled onto the Ocho. Like, no, you look at him anywhere behind stage, he's like, you're coming on? I'm yeah. like, I, I, I'm coming, yeah, I'm coming on. Yeah. I'll, be, uh, I'll be on there later. See ya. Daniel's Kevin like a T-Rex. Always... So you just have to freeze. He, yeah. If you move, he'll notice you. Yeah. But if you just stay still, he might pass you by. That's a Kevin always analogy. had the right idea. He would just bring snacks on there. And then that way he's like, I can't take a shot. I got Oreos. You know, they don't, <laughs> they don't go together. Who said that? Kevin, our guitar, he's like, he'd always like bring snacks onto the Ocho and be like, nah, I'm not drinking tonight. I got these M&Ms. And, you know, I just, <laughs> can't mix that. Jaeger now you and M&Ms gave it nice. away, Neil. Now they're going to be, now they're going to know. They're going to well, say no snacks. I want snacks. Kevin to experience the Ocho for real. They're going to like get rid of well, his snacks. Well, he's been on he there. The yeah. yeah, he is. Yeah. The he Ocho, but he he got, the Ocho leaves people, <laughs> like people, people uh, leave the Ocho, go to their own bus, and then like wet their bunks. That's how <laughs> that's how the Ocho rolls. Yeah, that's true. As long as they don't shit on the bus, wetting the bunk is yeah, fine. True. As long as yeah, true. Yeah, shit. I think you guys might have had that with one of your crew guys after they left. I don't bus. know what you mean. Like, no, yeah, it was probably. I think it was Phil. Phil, my guitar tech for that tour, uh, definitely peed on our lighting guy. <laughs> Just straight uh, up. So bad. And he didn't, I don't think he wanted so it either, bad. you know, which is, some people are into that, but he, uh, <laughs> he was not happy. And then he got so embarrassed by it. He's like, I'm never going on there again. And I think like, it was like the last day of the tour. He finally went back on there or something, but uh-huh. it's, uh, it definitely, uh, it definitely shows you, you know, how hard it can be to wake up the next day. Like 
I remember yeah. the couple of times that I went on there, I was just like, man, if I had to wake up the next day and kind of be the first one to load in, that would be one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. That's what people just... don't know about being in a band is that like you come to a show, you let off some steam, you have some drinks, you go a little crazy. You, it, you know, it's your, it's your night out for the month or it's your night out for that week or whatever it is. But then like the band goes and does it the next night and the next yeah. night and the ne mm -hmm. for months, months on end. So people come out on tour and they're like, Oh wow, this is awesome for like three <laughs> days. And like, I don't know how you guys do this mm -hmm. third day in every <laughs> yeah. single time. I don't know how you guys do this. Or they'll just come out for one night and just go way too hard. Yeah. Just get carried away with just overwhelming band, well, music, well, everything. Well, we, what we always say is no matter where we go, when it is, it's somebody's Saturday night. That's and they right. always like want to go big. And our bus was always there to oblige them. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of how it worked. It's nice to have a place to go and do that. You know, it's like when we were doing it, they'd just be like in our dressing room. It's like my mom's like in there. She's like getting wild. I'm like, mom. <laughs> Again, come on. You know, it's like I can be like, go to the Ocho. Yeah. I'll take care of you. So you got to be like, yeah. Here's a drink. Hey, his mom's here. Yeah. It's crazy. But Everybody that was, so, I mean, but honestly, that's what's so great about tour is that you have those moments and you have those places and you have, you make those friends. And, um, mm -hmm. It's so much like summer camp where you live with these people day in, day out for months on end. You go through travel and long nights and early mornings and load ins and all this stuff. And you see them at catering every single day and you party with them every night and you do stuff with them on days off. And then you the tour ends and you split and you go your own ways and like you hardly ever see these people anymore. Like, you know. <laughs> We would you, you, on that tour. We would do like Top Golf on days off, and we would go and do rad stuff, or go see movies, or anything. And now it's like I see you over Zoom. What the fuck? Hey man, yeah. at least we still get to see each other. It's like I I haven't seen the guys in my band in like a year. Like we did a yeah. live thing, and that was like the first time I saw them in a whole year. They were just they all everyone moved to different places now. We all used to live in the same town. Now it's all different. So why who moved where? We, because you got Kevin lives in Nashville. Yeah, Josh lives in South Florida. Alex oh, lives okay. here. I still see Alex every once in a while, but then Jeremy moved to, uh, he moved to Lady Lake, which is like some little town in Florida, but he's trying to redo his house. So he's like trying to save money, redo Got his it. house. And he's like living out of town. And so we all can't even, we don't even get to see each other. What happened to the guys, man? No, man. It's really, it's hard. COVID came <laughs> by and switched it all up. It's been the weirdest record release because it's like, you know, usually you're like on tour, you're all together, you're doing all these things like press, all this stuff. And for us, it's like we've had like two Zoom calls and we're like, oh, the record is out, isn't it? Holy shit, I <laughs> fucking forgot. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah we'll there. get through it. Well, we'll get through it. It's going to be nice when everybody gets back out on tour. It's going to feel, oh, I, man. it's going to be exhilarating. It's going to be more than just a first day of tour. It's the first day of life again. Yeah, like people are going to go crazy because it's just like, I don't think, I'm sure everyone realized how important live music was, but it's like to to really not have it for a year and not have that escape or that thing to look forward to, it's been crazy. Yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, this is the longest I've gone without doing a show in, since the early 90s. Man. That's crazy. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It's wild how long you guys have been like at it doing this professionally. I feel like, I don't know, I liked hearing what you guys are saying about we do these fun things on the day off, we're best friends. It's like going to summer camp because I've definitely been on tours where the headlining act, it doesn't feel like they're friends and it doesn't feel like they're stoked to be there every day. And I, I, that's really what stuck out with me with being with your guys' team is just how everybody's just on the same team making the show happen and nobody's too good for anybody else or anything like that. It's, it's just such a welcoming environment. And Thank you. Really was. Yeah, Thanks. it's a good vibe. Thanks, we, we, we try. We try and make that happen, and, you know, I'm glad that it, that it comes off that way. Yeah, and, and, and you guys have been working. How long have you guys been working together for now? Do you know? Like, how many years has it been? You and uh, Robert, Since Mark and Robert. 06? Since 06. Wow. Yeah. Oh, like 15 years. years. Yeah. 15 years counting the COVID year. If you count the COVID year. But it sounds we like count this year. Yeah. All right, but I mean, Robert's been working for me this whole year anyway. Like, yeah. you know, I've been working on um, on stuff at my house. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Robert's been shuttling equipment. I re we redid the storage space, uh, my locker there with all my gear. We sold a bunch of stuff through Reverb. You know, we've had bases built, guitars built, things fixed. So Robert's been working pretty steadily this whole year. Yeah. 
respect. I'm sure you guys are both so like thankful for each other's, you know, relationship in that regard where it's like, Hey, I can stay employed and you can get stuff done. And that's great. Um, now that you've kind of been a team for almost 15 years, I was wanted to kind of figure out what your day-to-day -day life was on the road and how you guys work together and what, I don't know, you've kind of, it's probably impossible to replace Robert at this point. Like he knows you so well, there's probably a lot of communication that goes on on stage that's almost telepathic to a level. But do you, like, what are some things, Robert, that, I don't know, you guys have developed over the years that really make you like Mark's guy? And what what is that like, like touring with somebody for that long? What are some things that you guys have? Uh, well, I mean, helped? it's kind of like um, you, you, over time, you just know what the, that person is looking for on stage, where the mic placement is, where the pedals go, all that kind of just regular technical stuff. But I know, like, if there's like, say like a new guy on the sound crew, like make sure that they're not like touching the mics. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm like really the only one who touches his microphone. You know, I clean his mic every night before, after whatever, you know, I know what, what he wants, where it goes, all those little kind of kind of mundane little things. I know it's part of my gig to know where all that thing, where all that stuff goes. And then like, you know, when there's guests in my world, like, you know, blah, 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 like, you know, make room for all these people and you know what I mean? Be accommodating and like, be cool. And all those just different things. And like, you know, when like on stage, things will get relayed to me to tell him, you know, from whether it be production or sound or whatever, or if there's an issue in the audience, Mark will tell me and I'll relay that message to whoever needs that, that information to go to, if like something, like if the study and something's going on in the audience, we'll find out from production. I'll get a hold of them and find out what's going on. So he'll know, you know, what if we have to slow the show down? What if we have to do this or that, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like um, up to you to know whether or not to like, should I tell him right now or should I wait? Cause like, you right. Some, sometimes that, but a lot, I mean, if it's something really crazy, I mean, that's obviously going to come from the tour manager, the production manager, like, Hey, we got to shut it down. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lightning getting close, yeah, yeah. which we've had happen, you know, I've got a really good picture actually of Mark holding a bass as an umbrella, like some <laughs> festival in oh Germany. <laughs> and then he tipped it over and this water just poured out of it. <laughs> you're like, yes, that's going to work great yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. So you're kind of like his filter. You're like, Hey, yeah, in you, a way. you, you yeah. make sure that he can do the show that Mark can do the show and just focus on doing that. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly my job is to make sure to just, help him do his whole thing without having to worry about any other stuff around him. You know what I mean? So it's, it's the, so we enable him to just go nuts and yeah, be funny on stage and do all the things that he does. Like have that confidence, you know, like you can go out there and be you do your thing. Like what everyone's there like, I want to see Mark, you know, tell a joke or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, honestly, the show, like, even still now, but like in the early days, it was, it was like a stand-up show in a way. I mean, it was, it was, yeah. it was always like, it was always jokes about moms and this and that. And it's, it's always been that way. It's always, like, we, like Daniel and I always look at each other laughing, you know what <laughs> I mean? Like going, Oh my God, that's so good. You know? And like after the show, we're like, I can't believe you said that. Like it was, you know, there's a lot of that. That's what it, it's, it's not taken seriously. It's fun. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's always a good time with our show and our crew and the band. Was it ever like uh who can like make the most people feel uncomfortable kind of thing? Like who can Tom say the I, wildest? Yeah, on um on the Mark, Tom, and Travis show tour, Enema of the State, Tom and I hit this, I don't know, month long run where we were just trying to see who could say the gnarliest thing on stage in front of fifteen thousand people. And I mean, it got gnarly. It got gnarly. I mean, it's all on the uh, Mark, Tom, and Travis show CD. It, you hear all the stuff at the end. But yeah, we were just was, trying to say the rudest stuff that we could think of. <laughs> what was like your What was like your tell? Like, could you like look at someone and like if you could make them laugh, you're like, you know that that's like a good one. If you I can make like... well, if I can make Travis laugh, I know that it's a good one. Um, if I can make Daniel laugh, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, Daniel. Um, We've been talking about Daniel. Daniel, we were referring to as Daniel Jensen. That's Travis's drum tech. Uh, he also builds all of Travis's drums, and he's been with us, I think, possibly the longest. Is he the is yeah. he the longest surviving yeah. crew member right now? Yo, for sure. Like he's yeah. a twenty something. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. I know. That, uh... um, so yeah, I know that if I if I can make them laugh, it's a good thing. 
And I, you know, there's so much stuff that we do on stage that only we know about. There's a lot of inside jokes. There's a lot of like, you know, I'm throwing picks at our monitor guy. Robert's throwing picks at Daniel. Daniel's, you know, just trying to fucking do his job. <laughs> <People> are... <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, we, have, the... we have a lot of fun on stage, uh, just in and amongst ourselves, our crew does. Those, those times, that's like the most important thing. I feel like it's like even if something goes wrong, as long as you can like look and like smile or laugh about it or like know that it's like no matter what's going on, it's like you're going to get through it. You have this team to like lean on like you can also laugh about it like yeah mm -hmm. that's like but that's what's great about our crew is we built this crew who know the difference between when it's time to go and party and when it's time to do the work and when on stage you can you know throw picks at the at the drum tech and when you're on stage and you need to make sure that you know a problematic um bass input jack is not going to fall apart during the show and there's a shorthand. I mean, I think that really talking about uh, band member and crew member, there's just a shorthand. And, and Robert really, for me, anticipates what I need before I even think to myself what I need. And he'll come up to me and he'll be like, hey, you know, what about if instead of this, we did this or, you know, you know, there's this new pedal out. You might want to check this out. Or, or, you know, we try different configurations and Robert's like, OK, this is how this is how that can work. And I can tell him like you know, do I need this pedal or can we do it on the camper or do we need this? And, you know, with the camper that I use, uh, for everything, recording, touring, the whole deal, I basically just handed it to Robert and said, can you please figure this out? I have no idea how to work a camper at all. Like, oh, man. I can, I can pull up my, some of the sounds, but Robert's really the, the genius behind all the camper stuff. Was that, uh, yes. that, so that was you, Robert, that decided to kind of move everything to camper? No, Mark decided to go to Kemper's. Okay. And I figured him out. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's well, kind of crazy. Somebody, Normally there it's... was somebody else was using them or everybody was starting to use them like nine inch nails and other bands were starting to, to use them because the, the technology had gotten better. And so then it was like, Oh, we can now model our amps, the ones that we use anyway. So then it was just like, Oh, let's just clone all the stuff we have. And then we just have everything at a, at, a, at our fingertips at all times, you know, which is I amazing. I originally bought the Kemper when I was living in the UK because I wanted to be able to have a bunch of different guitar sounds for demos. And I didn't realize how good the Kemper sounded until I actually moved back to Los Angeles and was in a studio recording something. And I brought in all my amplifiers and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to profile all my amps into the Kemper just so I have them. And then, you know, if I ever want to demo or have like a, a setup in the dressing room or whatever on tour, I can have a bunch of stuff to demo and it kind of sounds like my own thing. And when we were in the studio, we literally were at Conway studio. We had the Kemper coming up one channel of this Neve 88R and my actual setup mic'd and coming through another channel and not one person in the room could tell the difference between the two, including oh, yeah. like me, the, engineer the producer a producer who was working next door came in and nobody could tell the difference and after that i'm like well i'm sold like yeah. i'm using yeah. this like, thing forever it it's kind of crazy too because it's like everything that that you're talking about probably weighs like thousands of pounds like mm -hmm. base gear right. is known to be the heaviest gear of all gear but it's like Ooh. a kemper weighs like four pounds or something yeah you it's put so it in like ridiculous. one rack and yeah have an entire setup like that and travel around the world with something that sounds the same every single night yep, is, which is priceless. Amazing. Yeah. Like in totally. my head, like Robert, I, Robert was probably like, sign me up. <laughs> well, no, at first, at first I was like, Oh great. What's this thing. And then I started, and then when I started playing with it, I was like, Oh, this is amazing. And then look at all these things that it can do. And then we don't even use a fraction of the things that, that that thing can do the morphine and all that other stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, I mean, I went from, you know, all those cabinets, head racks, all that other stuff. I'm down to like three cases right now. It's like shaves like probably like an hour's worth of loadout time off. It's like, here's one case lid and I'm done. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I mean, I know people who uh, have even shortened it where they put the Kempers inside the vault. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's genius. That is, yeah. Genius. yeah that whole lower it's area like of the vault where you one. where you have the well, drawers no, they, and stuff, they, you could totally they, put those there. They have four. They have like four to five guitars in the vault, and then they have put a shock mount on the one side. So then there's a little trap door in the back, and you just plug oh. in the back of the 
cables. That's and genius. You pull the front off when you pull the lid off, then the the whole rack is exposed. So, so you literally just need one case, and that's your whole world. Well, I have a work box too, but oh, I mean, true, yeah, we, true. Yeah, but then there's that for for the actual live setup. I mean, a vault Man. could do everything now. It's like little things like that come along, and it's like, why didn't why why are we just now thinking about this? You know, it's like that seems like so obvious. It's like, of course, we would have put this little rack mount thing in here, and we could have yeah. just rolled in with that. It's I kinda, just think that the technology wasn't there yet. I think that yeah. you know the processing on just your consumer level chip wasn't there. Well, because they tried bands did it like years and years and years ago. I mean, I remember when Weezer tried to deal with the Line Six stuff, mm -hmm. and they were like the first band that I knew of that was doing that. And um, you know, it was it was just not there yet. You know, and then then you know all these new companies started coming along, all this new technology, and it just it was there. You know, I think and the now fact that you can better. like take your actual amp that you're like this is mine this is the one i know sounds good i trust it it's what i use all the time and then take that exact sound and put it into this thing and then that's when you plug your guitar in that's the, the sound that you hear out of it it's like yep not like yeah. not like a computer like this happens to be a mesa whatever it's like no this is the my exact amp right. recorded in or whatever totally it's well, the cool thing I, is, like, if you have like a particular, you have like a Mesa on a verse sound, and you have like a, a Fender on a co on the chorus, and something else on the bridge, you can have all that while you're playing. You know what I mean? It's just a yeah. switch, and then you have that the the album sound, live, without having to have twenty amps behind you. I feel like I don't even I have like to work a switch. I don't even have to know yeah. where I am on stage to push a button to have a distorted sound. It's all it's all coming off the uh, the time code for the uh, the click and everything else. All the lights are running off a time code, so I just feed off of that time code, send a MIDI signal to the Kemper, and it changes from my regular sound to a distorted sound to a chorusy sound to whatever it is that oh, I want. And I I don't have to push a button or anything. I need to build that. I need to like. This is the things that I need to be doing while we're off. I need to be like setting up this uh, <laughs> Pro Tools file or whatever it is to kind of like have those switches. Man, you need to you I need to have a Robert to come I help know. you out. You have a well, Robert. I do. I have yeah, him. like does. Max is is. Uh, Let's go. He, he basically is the Robert. I was like, Max, can you learn this Kemper? Because I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, but then whenever we we were kind of the last wave of bands that kind of had like. It was like twenty grand for us to fly our stuff to Europe and all this stuff, and then we played those couple shows with you guys, and I was like, "Wait, they're that's just Kemper. Like their whole show is just Kemper." Because mm -hmm. we were on the fence, like we were we were doing bad vibrations, and our our guy uh, Jason was telling us about it, and I was like, "I don't know, man. Seem I don't know. I don't trust it." You know, because at that time, all I had heard was like Line Six stuff. I was like, "I don't know. I don't know." We went and saw you guys, and I'm just like, "Holy shit! It sounds." They sound like Blink-182. They sound amazing. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. it doesn't sound any different. And they're using their rack is just like one little rack. That's it. I was yep. like, all right, let's yeah. try and do that. And then they yeah, told our, us how much we'd save. Our whole setup is what, like a 20 space rack or something, Robert? It was, it was actually when we first built the first one was in a 10 space rack. Okay, cool. And now we're, now we're back to a 16. Yeah. And it, and it has our main setup and the backup redundancy in it. It has two campers. Mm -hmm two wireless like two two of everything so it's mm. all redundant and that's it that's yeah that and the base is all that i need to do a show wow that's great it's like the tour manager equivalent of going from like a monitor and a whole like tower to just a laptop nowadays we're like oh this is easy i can just go in yeah. here and open this <laughs> laptop up and put it for guitar tech that's it great crazy and less stuff to block the photographers from shooting from places they're just no nothing on stage i was like trying to follow along <laughs> the conversation i was like all I'm hearing is less gear on stage, which I love. But <laughs> you guys are very technical. Everybody here plays instruments. I'm like, uh, oh, that's great. like, so the Kemper, he's like, mm -hmm, the Kemper. Yeah, like drawing okay. a map out here. I'm like, so, all right, guys. Like the meme with like all the numbers and letters. He's like, oh. <laughs> what is that from? Yeah. Just imagine. Yeah. Imagine, yeah, how about this? Imagine a pancake lens that could do anything you wanted it to do. It could be super telephoto. It could be super wide angle. It could be a prime. It can be, you know, a, a 0.95 f-stop, whatever, whatever it is you want it to be. And it's a tiny little pancake lens. That's Mark, an uh, amazing analogy. He's a translator yeah. between guitar yeah. and photographers. Yeah. <laughs> that is what just happened. Thank you. That was perfect. He I understand both. and I'm not a photographer. Yeah. I now understand photography. That's how good that was. Um, 
So after you guys have worked together for so long, for all the people out there who are kind of, you know, we're, we're talking to people who are trying to become guitar techs and trying to figure out how they can do a good job at this or bass tech or just a backline tech in general. Robert, what are some things that you've learned over the years and maybe not specific to Mark, but if you could just give some people some tips when they go out there of how to just be better at their job. I know that's a big category, but anything. I mean, in, yeah. I mean, in the beginning, it's just like, it's, it's learning. It's a, it's a craft kind of, I mean, you, you're there. The basics of an instrument are there. That, that's not that difficult. You can learn. I could show somebody that in an afternoon, like yeah. how everything plugs in and all that and how to tune. Um, but really the dynamic of, uh, of being on stage and interacting with the person you're working with, you know what I mean? And being focused on them and what they're doing and not being, you know, Oh, what's going on over here? You know, with these people yeah. like having drinks, like, um, it's, it's a lot of that. It's that dynamic of, you know, it's, and then eventually you start to learn everything and you'll start to know how campers work or amps or tubes and fuses and all that. That'll come in, in time as you, as you get more the into technical it. stuff. Yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, I played guitar in bands and I finally was like, they're like, Hey, you want to come out on like some friends? Were like, you want to come out and run up to Seattle with us? I was like, uh, all right. Yeah. And so I just jumped in a van and I mean, I didn't know how to fix anything. I could change strings. Yeah. I mean, but it was like that friendship and that camaraderie was like, it was more about the hang. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we get, everyone got along great and everybody was like, it's, it's a lot of that. A lot of the job is the dynamic of how you interact with everybody else and that everybody, you know, that you're, you're kind of down for whatever's going to happen. I mean, it's, and when you're small, it's like a gang, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you got each other's backs and you guys are going into a strange place and it could be hostile, together. it could be fun, it could be friendly. Um, but just kind of be kind of being open to those experiences and open and it just down to learn. Cause at the beginning, it's all about learn. It's all about like learning stuff. And like, you know, I always talk to like, you know, the opening, the opening band guys and like the, the their crew and like, Oh, have you seen this? And like a lot of times I'll learn stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, your guys, Johnny, he showed me a whole bunch of stuff on acoustic bridges. I had no idea about it. And I was like, Oh, that's amazing. Johnny's and crazy. Made, yeah. Johnny's amazing. So <laughs> it was like a lot of that kind of stuff. It's just, you gotta be, you know, always open to learning stuff and, and wanting to get better and improve. And if you can kind of keep that mindset from the beginning on, you'll do great, you know? And it, kind of goes back to just how you guys operate in general. There's no ego. Nobody's better than anybody else. You can learn from the opening band just as much as you could learn from, you know, somebody that's your peer or anything, you know, it, it, yeah. it, you're just open to these experiences. And then I will say this, I will say this as far as a uh, band member. Yes. Um, my thought on crew members is it, it takes a lot more than knowing how to fix uh, a blown tube or uh, a bridge or anything like that. It takes, uh, it takes intuition. It takes a lot of forward thinking. <clears throat> you have to anticipate what can go wrong, how it can go wrong and what you can do preemptively to make sure that that doesn't happen. You have to have a cool head because a lot of times things go wrong on stage while the show is going and there's, you know, thousands of people out there and something's wrong and you have to address a problem, find the, find the issue and correct it as quickly as possible. And there's, uh, there's just that intangible quality about somebody that is, fun to be with on tour and there's a there are some artists who want to talk to their tech a lot and be their friend and hang out and maybe you know go go see a movie on a day off go get some food on a day off and there are some artists who never want to talk to their tech at all and want them just to hand them a guitar and hand the, the, the guitar back at the end of the day and um at the end of the show and that's uh, a quality that you can't necessarily teach it's just one of those things like having a great producer in the studio knows how to get the best performance out of somebody. I think a great tech knows how to, you know, work toward the betterment of the show and keep the show going. No, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's nice to hear like how much you guys obviously agree on everything, but just how much of a team you are. Like it sounds, you know, when, for example, the Kemper thing, like, you know, Robert was helping you out to learn that, or he's open to learning these new things and, it's just, you work together so well and it really shows so that, you know, Mark can perform on stage and Robert can do his thing. And it's, I like to hear about these inside jokes you have on stage and all these things that go on that, I mean, it just sounds like you guys both genuinely enjoy working in everything you I do. do. And yeah. yeah, I like it. And yeah. I like working with Robert. Robert's dope. Mm -hmm. Robert 
like you know makes makes things happen makes it makes it happen in my world and makes it so that you know every time every night i go out my stuff's there the stuff that i need stuff that i didn't know that i need will be there literally i'll be like I'll sometimes turn to Robert and I'll be like, hey, you got any hand sanitizer? And he's literally has it in his hand. Yeah. Or, you know, or, you know, that, literally I'll awesome. walk no, out. Literally, like somebody will walk out on stage, like we'll be playing at a festival or something and we're about to walk out on stage and there's a local stage hand and he'll walk over and he'll, he'll be like, go up to my microphone and be like, test, test, one, two. And I turn to look at Robert and he's already grabbing the Lysa, or the, uh, <laughs> the, the Listerine to wipe down my, my mic. And, you know, it sounds like... Um, I think I think to the outsider, it sounds like it's an easy job to be a tech, but it's not at all. Yeah. A lot of people think that like you just you hang out with a band and you party and you fly and you see the world and you do all this stuff. And there's, you know, party backstage and party on stage and blah, blah, blah. And the techs, I mean, they're the ones that do all the actual work, you know, the they techs hold it are all the together. ones. The good techs are the ones that, that are serious about their job and, and make sure that their shit is banging and everything works. And, you know. Lights go down. Here's your instrument. Show's awesome. Lights go back up. Put everything away. Go have a great time. Get to bed. Whatever. The best techs make it look like it's a party all the time. You know, like they make it look like it's fun. It's like everyone's happy. It's like because they're so good at what they do, you don't even notice that they're also doing this insanely complicated job all at the same time. Like they're yeah. It's just. It's mind blowing to me. And all and all like, you know, in the middle of a or right right before we're walking on stage at a huge festival or something like that, I'll be like, uh, hey Robert, here's twenty of my friends and my family. They're gonna stand <laughs> right in front of you to watch the show. They'll be right in your way. They're gonna probably put drinks all over your stuff that you don't want drinks on. Can you just watch over everybody while you're also watching over me? And uh <laughs> thanks. Appreciate that. And he does it like, you know, my family's always well taken care of, my friends are always well taken care of. Robert's making sure that he can see what I need, but at the same time is making sure like, Hey, can you see? Okay. Do you want to stand over here? Do you want to do that? I mean, it's cool. You know, yeah, I want I'll everybody to walk away from the experience of coming to a Blink-182 show and be like, wow, that was awesome. That was a great show. Yeah. The lights were cool. The band sounded great. You know, people backstage are like, man, everybody was so cool. I don't let, you know, you go to some, some other people's shows and the backstage is just this weird, dark vibe with closed doors and no music playing. And, I don't know people are angry, people are stressed, blah blah blah. Like, man, this is music. We're not yeah. you know, we don't work in a hospital. We don't work in a fucking high stress. We're not stockbrokers. We're not um <laughs> police officers no, or any of these exactly. jobs where people are you know, dealing with life and death situations and and stress and and everything else. We're there to fucking celebrate life and have fun and be people Saturday night. Yeah. The moment that they can forget about all that other stuff. Exactly. Totally. They can come into that and just let it all go and like have the best time. I mean, we had Meg on here for the first episode and we talked about how she has candles and candy in her place and that's like her welcoming atmosphere. And we love that. Like, it's just those little things. I feel like every person on your crew is like, what part can I do contribute to the Blink-182 brand on and off the stage right. that True. is welcoming? Meg's desk is Halloween. Meg's desk is Halloween. <laughs> oh, yeah. Meg is, it's Halloween. is Halloween. <laughs> She's uh, cool. She's cool. I remember, uh, we we had had a run of shows on the last tour during during the um, the tour leading up to the release of Nine, where it was just raining every single day, and the, the, we were having problems with Travis's drum riser. And so our production manager at the time uh, started this shrine backstage, and it was it was literally <laughs> like it was some plastic um, like a goat or a donkey or something like that that they put yeah. a sombrero on and then somebody else added something to the shrine something added something so as people were coming in and out of the production office you were supposed to leave something that was important to you so i left like a empty lacroix can and and some wine <laughs> or something and it, by the end of the day it was like this i mean it looked like like a like a <laughs> satan's fucking <laughs> satan's den at disneyland with all kinds of toys and somebody put a knife down there and some, some people yeah. put money and coins and I don't know it was rad. It's just yeah. like that's the kind of shit backstage that I think goes a long way. Just because like that's the attitude of our whole thing is like rather than people getting absolute, and I'm sure people got yelled at when Travis's drum riser didn't work uh, for three days in a row or whatever it was. But the whole thing is like we'll make a joke out of it and be like, okay, we're gonna put an offering out there so that Travis's yeah. drum riser worked, <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. See, I mean, there's a lesson in there. 
Yeah, there's standout moments that me, Neil and I talked about prior to this where our first impressions of Blink were just, you know, it was from backstage, but it was like Reading and Leeds Festival. We were freezing after the show was over, and Daniel was nice enough to let us. Everybody had gone, and he just gave us a, a heated room to hang out until we had to leave. And it was just things That's like cool. that. that yeah. It was just so nice. It really and was. It's, you know he doesn't have to do that. You know he went out of his way. You know he took a time to do that. And it stands out, and I don't know. Well, that's... For us, we were like, man, Blink is so nice for letting us do this. But really, Daniel's like the last one there. He's not gaining anything from doing that. Like he, he's literally like, yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to use this. And he could have been, he could have been like, nah, shit's closed. Fuck off, right. <laughs> hang out somewhere else, you know. But well, like, yeah. he, Daniel, if, if he like, didn't like you, if he didn't like you, I mean, that probably would have yeah. happened. Oh, totally. <laughs> he would have shut the door in your face and been like, all right, see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, as he should, as he should. <laughs> No. Um, but I Daniel's mean, that kind of guy and you know like at the after the show band walks off stage the crew's you know rushing to put things up and you know get their stuff out of the way so that the rigging can come down so that the trucks can get loaded and everybody can go home and Daniel and our crew take you know whatever it is a minute 30 seconds 45 seconds to go and throw out drumsticks to kids or throw out picks or you know here's uh here's whatever here's a here's a uh, drum head that that uh, Travis used that was going to go in the trash, but here, give this to a fan. And that's the kind of stuff that people walk away from the show stoked on your band. Like it just, it reflects great all the way down. Like rather than yeah. a, a tech that's yelling at a kid, get out of here. We're trying to, yeah. we're done. You know, the show's over. Go home, everybody get out of here. Our techs are like, here, have a, have a, have our backstage for room. the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, cause to us, like we're this, these young kids playing in this band that like kind of looked up to you guys. And that meant a lot to us. We're like, man, this is badass. And we remember it. Like, I remember like every detail vividly. I was like, oh, this is awesome. You right. know, and and to, to these kids that are coming up, the techs that are interacting with them, you are an extension of the band. And True. everything you do is a reflection of the person you work with. And if you want to continue to have a successful run with whoever it is you're working with, you want to continue their brand even when they're not around. It's a huge thing. And I think even just those little things that a lot of times we take for granted or like, you know, like you're saying a drumstick or a pick, it goes so far with these young kids. They're, they remember it for the rest of their life. Like, you know, even if it wasn't from the band member, it's from the crew member and that means everything. Yeah. And absolutely. I think that is, I, rem really I can, I can remember every single artist who I've worked with, who cleared the halls when they were walking oh, to the man. stage. Uh I can yeah. I can name names and it it is just the most egotistical awful thing in my opinion to have that energy backstage like that is not a tour that is not fun that is not um welcoming in any way whatsoever to clear the hall because somebody's going to look at your talent oh. while they walk to the stage is just the lamest We've been we've been lucky enough to not to not have any of those yeah, for people who are listening, I know it's it's pretty straightforward, but basically backstage, anywhere where people might be existing, catering, dressing rooms, before this artist went on stage, they would just require, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I've never actually had it done to me, but basically everybody's out of the hall so they don't have to interact with anybody. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Literally yeah. walk through, clear the halls, clear the halls, coming through, clear the halls, or else, you know, turn and look at a wall. If you're walking somewhere, you just turn and <laughs> it's so dumb. Like That's so demeaning <laughs> feeling. It's like so yeah. like get at why are you like become non-existent please right now we wouldn't mm -hmm. have lasted on anything like that we like play loud rap music and uh we like stand at the edge of our door <laughs> stare them down yeah. one of the one of the highlights of tour and like the the things i'll keep as an accolade on my wall was when mark walked into data members dressing room and told everybody they were like children nerd children playing computer games all day and i was like <laughs> yes <laughs> we did it they get it yeah <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think we said it when we were talking to Neil on my radio show, but we had a Tumblr at one point that was uh, things a day to remember would buy. And it was like, um, <laughs> it was like, you know, a video game set up for a speedboat or like the most ridiculous gaming chair you've ever seen. Or I don't know, like a, a, a machine that makes popcorn and nachos at the same time. Yeah. No. Yes. I mean, worthless we, inventions. Or worth very worth. I'm like over here with no, a notepad. No, not even like... worthless. Like things that if if you gave a 13 year old a million dollars, what would they do? <laughs> That's what it's like in a day to remember's dressing room. 
It's like signs onto Amazon, buys nacho and popcorn machine. <laughs> Same day delivery. Yeah. I mean, you're not wrong. It's it's one of those things where we've kind of been fortunate enough to kind of like have this uh been able to do what we do for so long now that it's like we don't know if we are 15 or we're 30 something years old and we kind of still are doing the same thing that we did when we were that age we just kind of want to play music and hang out and have fun and really make the best time for everyone like you said i think it i don't know it's it, i i wouldn't want to do it if it was any other way to be completely honest you know and yeah it's 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 I think you said it earlier too, is like a lot of people think it's a certain way to go on tour, but it's actually really hard. I think you like sacrifice a lot of things. You give up a lot of like time with like your loved ones and, and it's not like normal hours where like when you're off, like you kind of like get to relax. It's a lot of like, Hey, tomorrow at 6am, we're going to go do this thing on this show. And then you got to have all my gear prepped and ready from the night before. Oh, and we're still going to play a show the night before. And then after that radio show thing, you're going to be back at the show and you need to have my gear set up for later that night. And it's like, it's not easy by any means. I mean, no, it's definitely a cool job, but, and I'm sure there's harder jobs also, but it's not an easy oh, thing. Yeah. And, there is no more difficult job than being a bassist in Blink-182. Hardest <laughs> job in the world. <laughs> Can you agree with this, Robert? Oh yeah. Difficult. Right. He vouches. Difficult, yeah. Well, before we finish up here, we're getting at about that time. We do have an important question to ask, and we'll ask. We can start oh, with yeah. Robert here, but um, we want to know, and this might have changed over the years, shower shoes or no shower shoes? What's your vibe? Shower shoes. Okay. It's hard, yeah. This, the oh, hard yeah. answer. Just a hard oh, shower shoes. Yeah, you have to. Like Fair enough. We've Well, you know what, though? I mean, now that we do shows at some really nicer places – you could probably get away with not doing it, but mm -hmm. I kind of still do. But I mean, we've done, and Mark has too, like we've done shows in some really nasty places, really gross places. And you don't even want to shower, but it's like, I haven't had a shower in four days. And this is the first one I've seen. Yeah. And so like, I'm right. going in, you know, or even like if I've done the thing where I've just thrown towels on the floor in the shower just to shower because I didn't have shower shoes. But yeah, I, it I looks always like have the. Them. The scene of Saul, the movie. Yeah. You're like, I guess I'll shower here. Yeah. That's <laughs> fine. I guess I'll do it. It's like blood and shit. And you're like, yeah, it's fine. No, no. Just get it done. It's fine. We'll move on. Yeah. So same with you, Mark. Shower shoes. Shower shoes. But the, the sad irony is that when we were playing the really small clubs that were just dirty, 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 I probably didn't wear shower shoes forever and I just didn't care. Um, or I just pee in it before I took a shower. That's supposed to kill all the germs. Yeah, but that's I don't yours. Think that, you that's know, a first you know. one. <laughs> that's what? That's a first of somebody saying that's how they clean the shower. Hey. That, I'm not the first one to say it. Madonna said no. it and caught a whole lot of hell for it. Madonna said oh, when wow. she tours, she pees in the shower to, to clean it. And I'm like, yeah, I do the same thing sometimes. See, but these, are, these are the tips we need on here. Yeah, we do but need that. But the thing is, I don't think it sanitizes anything because it's just <laughs> sterile. I don't think it's a disinfectant by any means. And it's it's definitely gross for whoever is behind you, even if it all does go down the drain. So um, <laughs> don't really do that anymore. But I do use shower shoes now. Uh, and we're playing nicer places. And in fact, what I do is I not only have shower shoes, but I have in my kit that goes into my dressing room like a spray bottle of some kind of disinfecting bathroom cleaner. So I'll go in beforehand, spray spray the handles and, you know, the areas that I'll touch and then take a shower that way. And just you were, breathe in you were these prepared toxic... For corona. These toxic fumes. I've been preparing for corona my whole <laughs> professional career. You're I can ready. tell you at any given time the last dirty thing that I touched. Any given time. I can tell you the last time that I touched something dirty. <laughs> Respect. I, I, we, I, we'd like to know, I guess, now. Yeah, what's uh, the, last? the last thing that I touched that was dirty uh, is the um, the handle on the uh, on the thing to my backyard, my gate, my gate leading into my backyard. Man, it's it's you're ready when touring comes back. Nothing changes for you. We no. just need to be more <laughs> like Mark Hoppus. I'll probably wear more masks than I did before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely wearing masks on airplanes from here on out. Like I'm, oh, yeah. I'm gonna wear a mask on airplanes for I always, the rest of my we, life. We would go to Japan and see yeah, that, and Tokyo I'd be like, "Man, I think I'm gonna start doing that." And then I like would do it for like ten minutes and be like, oh, "I can't do this." People yeah. in America like, used to look at you weird. Yeah. Well, but it's smart. Like uh, you're it traveling really in this tube with a bunch of. I mean, 
air doesn't like you just smell farts the whole time so it's not like you're <laughs> it's not like it's the cleanest air i mean you're just traveling in a big giant fart tube so you might as well put a mask on yeah it's the least we could do mm-hmm and on that note, <laughs> I think we're pretty much good to finish it up. Neil, you want to get the Kevin Scaff send off here real fast? Yeah. So Kevin dual- Scaff, um, he created the intro and outro music for the podcast. And every time we have a guest on, uh, we ask them to send it off to Kevin Scaff in their own words. So if you guys could do that, that'd be awesome. Okay. Uh, this is Mark Hoppus signing off on Don't Shit on the Bus. I want to thank Adam, I want to thank Neil, I want to thank our guests, Mark Hoppus and Robert <laughs> Ortiz. Now to play us off, Kevin Scaff. Kevin! There you go. Kevin, take it away. 